We are in the midst of a uh, look through the book of Hebrews, and we're calling this uh, series Radiance, and that is based on uh, chapter 1, verse 3, which serves as kind of like a thesis statement for the whole book, that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory in the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And so we, uh, by God's grace, get to live in the midst of that radiance, in the shadow of that radiance. Um, so I want to start, this sermon is called, uh, You Go to Who You Know. And so, <clears throat> that's an expression. Have you heard that expression? You go to who you know. And the idea is that when you're in a fix, when you're in a jam, there's some sort of problem that you're dealing with and you're not sure how to get out of it on your own, you go to who you know, right? The idea is that you go to, don't go to someone you don't know. You go to someone who you do know personally, who you knew to be trustworthy, someone who has a track record of being very helpful, right? You go to who you know in those situations. Uh, one of the radio programs around our house that gets a lot of play is called Adventures in Odyssey. So it's about these adventures of these kids and families living in the town of Odyssey. Uh, and many of the episodes center around this location, Wits End. It's this radio show that uh, Focus on the Family puts out. It's really great. And Wits End is owned by John Avery Whitaker. Wits End, clever title. Anyway, every couple episodes, someone gets in this jam. They need some wisdom, advice, help, or whatever. And, you know, lo and behold, the person they seek out for wisdom and help is Wit. John Avery Whitaker, right? Because he's trustworthy, they know him, he's dependable, he's got this reputation of being very helpful to people, right? And so we see this in other places, we see it in wider culture, society. Um, as I was putting this together, I thought of one of the early scenes from, you know, the, the, the well-known Star Wars movies, and there's this, you know, computerized image of Princess Leia that comes out of R2-D2. Um, you know, this is our most desperate hour, help us, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're our only hope, right? And so you go to who you know, and I think that in our own lives, we can think of times or situations when we've been in trouble, when we have been maybe in over our heads. We don't know how to get out of a certain jam that we are in. And so who do you go to? Someone with the most degrees? Someone with the most awards? Well, not, not necessarily. You go to someone who is trustworthy. You go to someone who's dependable. Someone who, you know, you can share honestly with what you're, what you're dealing with. You go to who you know. And the reason I start off like this is because I think part of the reason why we often don't open ourselves up truly to God, to come to him with, with just utter honesty, with passion, inviting him into those raw and difficult places in our lives is because we don't actually know his heart as well as we probably should. You don't go to who you don't know. You go to who you do know. And so this section today from the book of Hebrews is about better understanding God's heart, that we might go to him more freely, more willingly for help and mercy in our time of need. And so that's what our text is going to explore today. Now, a couple things. I want to give us kind of a high level, uh, kind of a quick review on the book of Hebrews. And then I'm going to talk about two terms that we need to have clear in our mind, because some of these passages, as you've been finding out, are pretty dense. They're pretty thick. Um, and so I want to highlight two terms and their meanings. So as we go through, we don't need to stop too quickly on them because we will have already have discussed them. Okay. So the book of Hebrews, uh, written most likely in the early to mid sixties, right? To a group of Christians who are experiencing hardship and persecution. And they're going through these difficulties and uh, they're, they're most likely at risk of falling back from their commitment to Jesus. Maybe this Jesus guy isn't all he's cracked up to be. And so they're at risk of falling back from this commitment and part of the problem for their lives uh, as a result of this is that when you, as I've been saying, when you lose confidence in your leader, you lose courage for the battle. And so they're losing confidence in Jesus, therefore losing courage for their battle. And so part of the reason that Hebrews is written is to provide clarity. This is who Jesus is. He is human like us. He shares in our weaknesses and uh, our challenges our, in terms of our fleshly, but he never succumbs to temptation. He is our high priest. He's also divine. He is sufficient. He is able to do all these things. He, he, he is greater than Moses. And so the list goes on about uh, all the challenges that, that we face and how Jesus can help us in and through all those things, right? Uh, so this is kind of what's going on. And last week we talked about the Sabbath rest of God. So... We have this Sabbath rest of God, this capital R, rest in peace that is coming to those who remain faithful to the very end. And this is to motivate us as we live through our hardships in life. And so the passage about the Sabbath rest of God is meant to motivate and encourage people to keep going, hold fast in the faith. Okay, So that's kind of the high-level overview. Now the two terms I want us to remember is, the first is high priest. So um, 
high priest really, remember, remember, think of the temple, the sacrificial system. And the high priest would have been a title that, for the original readers of Hebrews, uh, they would have been very familiar with that because they're very familiar with the sacrificial system of the Old Testament and everything else. The high priest represented the people before God, offering sacrifices, seeking forgiveness and restoration with God. That was the job of the high priest. Okay, so we need to keep that in mind. And Jesus comes as this great high priest, someone who has, who has done this job better than anyone else. And, and in fact, he himself is the sacrifice for all of us, and he represents us before God. So that's the first thing. The second is a name, Melchizedek. Now, it's a name that you don't, you can tell it's a Bible name, right? Um, but it's not one that comes up very often. And so let me just give you, it comes up twice in today's passage. Let me just give you a quick review. So uh, it comes up twice before this passage. The first time is Genesis 14. So way back in the book of Genesis, and the, kind of the background is that there's these, this is way back in the time of Abraham. So before the Hebrews go to Egypt for slavery, before they're freed under the leadership of Moses, before the Ten Commandments, before the temple, before David, before all that. So Abraham, and there's these, these, these warring kings, and there's this, these battles, and Abraham's nephew Lot gets captured. And so Abraham goes, defeats the kings, he rescues Lot. And then all of a sudden, as if out of nowhere, this figure named Melchizedek appears. And he is the king of Salem. And later it will be called Jerusalem, right? King of Salem. He's also a, a priest of the Most High God, which is really interesting. And he, and he offers this, you know, he offers, you know, bread and wine. And the name Melchizedek means um, roughly king of righteousness, right? And so there's kind of some similarities. Wait a second. Um, priest of the Most High God. He's the, the king of righteousness. He brings bread and wine. So he foreshadows Jesus, and so he's used in this passage as a foreshadowing of Jesus, someone who is meant to think of this greater high priest who is to come. Okay, so with those things in mind, let's open the Bibles to um, Hebrews 4. Uh, and we're going to start at verse 14. I'm reading from the NIV. And uh, the words will be up there on the screen so that we can follow along as well. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Okay, so as we said last week, it's like so many of these sections start with the word therefore, meaning it's just a kind of a continuation of the argument. It's logically connected to what uh, had just gone on before. And recall that that previous passage was about, you know, holding fast, staying true, remaining faithful to the end uh, so that we can achieve that Sabbath rest of God, capital R, rest and peace that we will enjoy at the end of our lives and I think part of the reason this text comes now is because maybe some of those people are thinking, it's hard, we're dealing with persecution and hardship, and we're tired, we're not sure that we can make it on our own. And so this text comes along, don't, you, you don't have to do it on your own. God is here. You need to know his heart. And so this um, text comes in to help explain us uh, something more about God's heart and to explain that they are, in fact, not alone. We are to hold firmly to the faith we profess. Notice how in every week it seems to be this idea of holding firmly something keeps coming up. It's a repeated theme time and time and time again. Hold firmly to the faith we profess. Don't hold it haphazardly. Don't hold it loosely. If that was what was required, then it would have said that. Hold firmly to it. Uh, my son Benjamin, about a week and a half ago, was with a friend, and he was holding this soccer ball, and his friend was trying to wrestle this soccer ball from his arms. I was just amazed at how committed these two 10-year-olds were to being in possession of this soccer ball. It was like the most important thing they'd ever done. They needed to be in possession of that soccer ball. Um, the soccer ball is our faith. Hold firm. Okay. Verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, Yet he did not sin. Okay? So this speaks of the sinlessness of Jesus, but at the same time, he's human like us, and so he can empathize with our situations. So this, again, goes to the humanity of Jesus. Um, but it says that he has not sinned, and we need to remember that. Um, see, sinners need a Savior. A Savior doesn't need a Savior. So Jesus doesn't need to be there to save himself from himself. He has not sinned. Now, part of the reason that's significant, just a part of one of the many dimensions of why that's significant, is because if you think about, you know, as Jesus leads us forward, um, offering forgiveness, uh, number one, he's the only one qualified to do it, uh, offering forgiveness, but also as he is leading us through the pathways of life and we seek wisdom from him, he is the one that we can trust to have that wisdom that is of eternal value. So, say for example, 
in your life someone comes and corrects you. Maybe they're even chastising you. Hey, you shouldn't have done that. Or, hey, this is what you should do. But you know in your mind that that person doesn't do that themselves. And, and, and they're giving you advice that they're not living by. So what do, you, what do you think? In your mind you're thinking, hypocrite. Right? Jesus is the opposite of hypocrisy. He is living with perfect wholehearted faithfulness and obedience, thought, word, and deed. So he is the one qualified to lead us forward. He is without sin. Verse 16, here's the key verse. Let us then, because of that, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Wow. Okay, that's awesome. This is an amazing verse. So what do we learn here? And you've got to remember that who, who's worthy? Am I, am I worthy to approach God's throne of grace? Not by myself, I'm not. Are you? Not by yourself, you're not. Uh, no, more on that in a second. God has a throne. It's a throne of grace. Jesus often speaks of the kingdom of God. This is where the, the place uh, from which the king reigns and rules, where he administers justice, where he shows his loving care for his creation. Okay, this is the throne. But we're told a specific word about this throne. It's God's throne of grace. And this is, this is something very key, right? It's not the, the throne of eternal condemnation uh, for those who are in Christ. It's not, it's not the throne of fear. It's the throne of grace. Now, we need to remember this word. What does it mean? Because we hear it so much, amazing grace. We say grace at dinner. What does it mean? Grace means generosity that you don't deserve. Generosity you don't deserve. Sometimes theologians will say unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. So if you think of three words, and I, I like to do this comparison sometimes because it, it's helpful to tease out the real meaning of grace. Think of justice and then mercy and then grace. Okay, so there's justice. What is justice? Well, tit for tat, an eye for an eye. You know, tooth for tooth. You know, that, you know, you punch someone, they punch you. That's justice. You know, you get what's coming to you. That's justice. Mercy is getting less than you deserve. So let's say that you borrow someone's car and you crash it. And um, instead of them uh, crashing your car, you know, for retribution, they instead say, well, that's too bad, but I guess your punishment is, why don't you just rake my lawn? Like, wow, well, that's, that's less than you deserve. That's, that's them showing you mercy. Grace is that generosity you don't deserve. And so let's say you go into someone's house and uh, you steal their TV and you come out I know you wouldn't really do this, of course. Uh, you steal the TV, you come out, and, and they come out and they accost you. And you're like, oh, I'm so sorry. And like, oh, I, actually, here's, here's my computer as well. That's generosity you definitely do not deserve, right? And so this is the grace that we have been shown in God through faith in Jesus. Because of that, we can approach with confidence, or the word could be boldness to this one. We can approach God's throne, not with a spirit of fear, but with confidence, with boldness. This is a beautiful gift that we have. And for us to like realize, why is that? Why is that even possible? Well, we need to remember that... The central to the New Testament message is that we have been adopted into God's family as children. Okay? So God chooses us. I choose you. I extend the hand to you. You respond by faith in Jesus, our great high priest. And we become adopted into the family of God. And so we need to think of it like this parent-child relationship. It's because we approach the thought of grace. Hi, Father. So that changes our understanding of how how we can approach the throne of grace with confidence and with uh, boldness. And then we receive mercy and grace in our time of need. It could also be to receive timely help. So we're going to receive help from God. So we come, we're just honest, we're open. Father, we're in this situation, we need grace, we need mercy, we need help. This is our time of need. When's he going to respond? Sometime, you know, way in the future? No, it's, it's timely help. It's, it's, it's help in our time of need. Imagine, again, think of a parent-child relationship. So imagine a child calls out in the middle of the night. They're crying. They've had a nightmare. What do you say? Put a sock in it. I'm exhausted. See you in the morning. <laughs> no. Like, that's the opposite of loving, right? Um, so don't do that. You go right in that moment, hey, and you hold them, you embrace them, and, and, you, and you hug them, and hey, it was only a dream. Do you want to talk about it? So it's timely help in those moments. And how can we go in here? Well, we can go in because of this great high priest, Jesus, from what he has done for us on the cross. And so when we enter the throne room, it's as if Jesus puts his arm around us 
and says, this one's with me. This one's a part of the family. This is one of my brothers and sisters, as we learned in the previous chapters. Right? This one's with me. Nina's with me. Glenn's with me. Susie's with me. Stephen's with me. And we're led into the throne room of God's grace for timely help. Continuing, for, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. So now he's going to talk about, the author's going to talk about earthly high priests to compare how Jesus is greater. Every high priest is selected from among the people and it's appointed to represent the people in matters related to God. To offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. Right? So the, the earthly priests, they would have uh, had sins themselves and had weaknesses. They could relate to the people and deal gently with them because they know what it's like. Right? However, verse 5, in the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. Right? He didn't muscle his way into the job. But God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father which is a quote from Psalm 2, which is meant to show us that this close father-son relationship is a part of God's plan. Verse 6, and he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. This is a quote from Psalm 110. So remember that priest Melchizedek. The idea here is to stress that whereas earthly priests have a beginning and end date to their term of service, not so with Jesus. He's in this it's as if he's in this order of Melchizedek. And so it's meant to encourage us to think about Jesus' priesthood in our lives uh, with eternity and divinity. Verse 7, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission or obedience. So this might be a reference to Luke 22, right? Before his crucifixion. You know, if it's possible to take this cup from me, but not my will be done, but yours, right? It could be a reference to that, or it could be just a general reference to his life. Verse 8, son though he was, he learned obedience from what we suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So, um, source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. This is great. This high priest ushering us into the throne room of God's grace. Eternal salvation, the eternal, never-ending gift of new life, forgiveness, peace with God. It's a beautiful gift that we are given. Um, but notice, for all who obey him. So, we're used to hearing at this point, for all who put their trust in him or have faith in him. And so, this is picking up on the idea that uh, if you have genuine faith or trust in Jesus, uh, it will involve change in your life. Right? So you are, start to undergo this transformation. And Jesus himself says in uh, John 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. So we stumble, we struggle sometimes, maybe we have bad weeks, maybe even years, but we are seeking by God's power and grace to grow in Christ's likeness, seeking to obey him. And we end the text at the end of verse 10. So this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so at the start of this, I said that this passage really helps us understand more of the very heart of God. Who is God? What is attitude? What is his disposition towards us? And we're focusing in on verse 16 in chapter 4. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence or boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is so very central to us understanding who God is and what God's heart is like toward us. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. So the original readers are hearing this. They're not sure if they can make it to the very end and persevere through their hardship. It's like, no, you can because God is with you. Not only that, but you can approach his throne of grace with confidence and you will find timely help and need. You will find grace. And that same message is true for us as well. But for us to take that seriously and for us to live like that is so, we need to look at that word grace. Generosity we do not deserve because I think sometimes deep down, it's like we don't really believe that. We think, no, God is too distant. He is too far. He is too severe. He is maybe even too apathetic to care about me and to be involved in my life and to hear my prayers and petitions and to give little old me help. And that's why we need to remember that we've been adopted into the family. Adopted into the family. Think the perfect father-child relationship, unconditional love. That's the one who sits on the throne of grace. Duane and Lori Hargis had fostered a variety of children. 
And these children had gone through difficult experiences in, the, in their lives. And they were praying, God, what do you want us to do? And they felt led by God to adopt this one particular uh, child that they've been fostering. Her name is Olivia. Reader's Digest tells the story. Although Olivia had experienced hardships in her young life, she eventually learned that she could trust Duane and Lori. Lori recalls, she was very used to people giving up on her and not wanting her. She tried to test the waters with us. When she figured out we weren't going to give up, she finally learned to trust and love us as her parents. And that tells us something very significant and powerful about the relationship we have with God. We're testing, you know, we're, you know, finally we learn to trust God because he will not give up on us as well. So again, look at this verse 16. Sorry, let's go back one. Verse 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's what a loving parent does, okay? That's what a loving parent does. And now we can go to the other slide. And the idea is that this actually encourages us and changes how we interact with God. And the reason is because when you know God's heart, you're more likely to open yours, right? You go to who you know. You don't go to who you don't know. And so if you realize that God is is favorably disposed toward you on this throne of grace, and that's who he is, and he loves you and wants the best for you, you're more likely going to share something of your own heart. So when you know God's heart, you're more likely to open yours. We don't do this when we only pray on Sundays. We don't do this when we just pray by rote, you know, only reading through monotonously words that matter to someone else. We don't do that when we hold our tears back from God we don't do that when we don't let him into those raw, challenged, difficult places in our lives and just pretend that everything is okay. Verse 16, I'm really trying to nail this down in our minds. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, confidence, not timidity, confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Friends, we need to learn to be Hebrews 4.16 people. And I don't want to scare you, but I'm going to do some speculating. Okay? We need to be those people who approach God's throne of grace with confidence, boldness, for help in our time of need. Let me do some speculating. What if COVID-19 never ends? I hope it does. Things are changing. What if it does end, but something comes along in a year or two that is way worse, way more deadly, and way more life-changing? A couple years ago, I would have thought, ah, that's, nope, not possible. Now I'm like, yeah, maybe. What if the world in which we live continues to go further from the Lord's commands instead of closer? What if persecution that we often hear about in previous eras, eras ramps up on us, on the people of God? What if there is a new, what if all this stuff currently did come to an end? And, but what if there is some new controversy every three months? What if the division that is sometimes felt in these days within families or businesses or churches or workplaces or within friendship circles, whatever, what if that was going to persist? Would we then become a Hebrews 4.16 people on our knees just calling out <laughs> to God? What if the mental and emotional fraying the fatigue that so many people are experiencing is actually, unfortunately, going to be an ongoing reality until we take our last breath in this world. Will we then learn to be a Hebrews 4.16 people? There was a, I read about this guy, he was on one of those, you know, remote control bulls. You know, sometimes outside of these restaurants, they have these store sections connected to them and, you know, put in $2 and, you know, there's some arcades and there's this remote control bull. And this guy's on here and it's kind of starting to buck him around, Right. And he's going, and all of a sudden a crowd starts to gather because that's kind of a crazy thing to watch. And he's going around, and he thinks he's doing pretty good, and he's holding on to this you know, remote control bull. And he thinks he's on the highest level, but the guy who operates it yells out, you're on level one. And he's like, oh, man. And so all of a sudden it starts to like buck more, and it starts to get crazier and crazier and crazier. And someone who's come up to watch this charade realizes this guy has never done this before, and he offers him a word of advice. He says, stay centered. <laughs> stay centered. That's advice for us today. 
Who knows what next week will hold or next month or next year or the next decade? We don't know. What we do know is Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's what we do know. So I got a little job for you, an invitation, challenge, whatever you want to call it. I want to encourage you this week um, when you're doing your devotional time, uh, and I know you're all doing that daily, right? Um, take one of those days, just read through the passage that we've gone through today. So Hebrews 4, 14 to chapter 5, verse 10, to read it through. And I want you to underline or, or highlight verse 16. I've done it here in my Bible. I encourage you to do so. And I just want you to take some time to just do that. Do that. Just come to God's throne with boldness. Talk to God about things you've never talked about before. Maybe talk to God with the kind of passion and honesty that it actually kind of scares you. Make passionate prayer your new normal because, my friends, we need to be a Hebrews 4.16 people. When you know God's heart, you're more likely to open yours. You go to who you know. Thanks be to God. Amen.